I want to talk about today is why it costs so much, why healthcare in the U.S. costs so much money. And I'm going to do this in a comparative perspective. So I want to compare the United States with other countries. And I'm going to do that by comparing costs and outcomes across different countries over time. When we talk about cost, I'm going to talk about spending per person, and I'm going to adjust the dollars for inflation because we're going to look over time, and I'm going to translate everything into U.S. dollars uh, in a system that, that, that is commonly used for making that kind of translation. So I'm going to compare the costs of healthcare against the outcomes of healthcare. Because after all, healthcare is really important. We think it does good things for us. If we're getting better outcomes, even if we're spending more money, who cares, right? Or maybe we still care, but not so much. So we're going to look at outcomes. And my favorite measure for outcomes is male life expectancy at age 40. Now, why a life expectancy at age 40 and not at birth or younger? Well, um, life expectancy at birth is actually very sensitive to methodological decisions about how you address premature births and stillbirths and other things like that. So some people are concerned about that. But the other reason I like to look at males at age 40, now that I can look across the room, I'm sort of safe saying this, by the time you're 40, all the exciting things in your life are over. Um, so, so if you think about all the behaviors that might get you in trouble that we might think are not anything to do with the healthcare system, by the time you're 40, that's not such a big deal, right? Uh, and we can be thinking about something that is much more closely linked to the healthcare system itself. So I'm going to look at male life expectancy at age 40. You might ask, why am I not looking at female life expectancy at age 40? And the reason is the US does incredibly badly with female life expectancy at age 40. Does anyone know why? Our life, female life expectancy has been doing, has actually not improved as much as we would have liked it to. The main reason is that women began smoking in the US, and those smoking rates are now translating into worse life expectancy. So the male, this is the best story I can tell about the US, and that's the story I'm going to stick with. We'll see why in a minute. So I want to try and explain US performance, why we see what we do, and fo focusing particularly on the cost side. And then I'm actually going to put forward a pretty novel theory that I am out there trying to sell. Um, and we'll see if anyone's buying. But first, we'll see if any of you are buying. So let's see uh, what's going on. So this is a picture of the various countries in the high income world in 1976. You can see that I have male life expectancy on the bottom axis. That's what I told you I was going to look at. So basically, a 40-year-old man in 1976 could expect to live about 33 years more to about age 73 uh, in the United States. And we were spending about $1,800 a year per capita on health care. Now, one of the things you can see here is that all the other countries in the world, all the countries are pretty closely clustered. They're all, they all have very similar life expectancy. They all are spending the same amount. In 1976, we looked just like everybody else. Just think about that for a minute, because you'll see that we don't anymore. But in 1976, we looked just like everyone else. I've also highlighted Australia here. I think Australia is a great comparison for the US. We often compare ourselves to like France, where they eat the Mediterranean diet and olive oil, and all the women are slim and everything. Um, or Japan, where like everybody eats fish. We're talking about Australia, Crocodile Dundee. You know, um, I don't know what they eat in Australia, but I don't think it's terribly healthy. Um, so I want you to focus on Australia, because I think it's more similar uh, in some ways to us. I also want to point out, because there's a lot of conversation about this, that all of these other countries, either then or very shortly after, have universal health care systems. Every country's health care system is different. No two countries have the same healthcare system. And in particular, if I look at these, Switzerland has a system of competing private insurance companies. Everybody's covered, but it's entirely a private system. Sweden is a more nationalized system. Australia is basically a system in which about half the population is in a public insurance plan, and half the population buys their own private insurance. So a great deal of diversity in health systems among these countries. OK, so that's 1976. Ready? Here's 1986. The US is a little more expensive than the rest of the pack. They're spreading out a little bit. And there's Australia, a little cheap. Um, everybody's doing a little bit better in terms of health status, too. We're seeing real improvements in health status. That's the era where we're starting to see hypertension drugs come online and other things that are helping 40-year-old men live longer. 1996, oh my goodness, we're pulling away from the pack there uh, on the spending side. The other countries are all uh, it's pretty much down there around $2,000, and we've jumped up to four. But also, you see that everything is moving rightward. People are doing better. Health is improving. You're starting to see statins come along. Cholesterol is being controlled. And smoking rates are dropping. There's 2006. And 
And here's 2016. OK, wait, I'm going to just go back there. There's just one. I just want you to see that, right? Look at all those other countries closely clustered together. Look at our friends in Australia, Crocodile Dundee, way down there. Uh, and look at us. Uh, we have now, we're now way, way more expensive and quite different from the rest of the countries. Um, so what, what, on the other hand, we are doing better. People are living longer. We're spending more, but people are living longer. So we are getting more, and we're spending more, right? The problem is that other countries are getting more and more and spending less more. Um, so they're doing better than we are in terms of this, both the cost metric and the outcome metric. If they were just doing better on the cost metric, OK. But they're doing better on both the cost and the outcome metrics. So this is the big challenge for US health policy. What is going on? Because we looked the same in 1976. That's the really important thing to think about. So as I'm going to show you the next slide, and as you think about what's going on, an important thing to realize, these countries all different from each other, different food, different cultures, different everything, different healthcare systems, very different from one another. And we're looking at the passage of time. So you have to, if you want to give me an explanation for what's going on, it's got to be something that's true in the US today and was not true in 1976. It's got to be true in the US today and not true in any of those other countries, because they're all looking pretty much the same. So when I put it that way, you can see we used to look pretty much like everybody else. Now we do worse, and we spend a lot more. And it's not because of obesity. Turns out the country in the world with the second highest rate of growth in obesity was Australia. Um, so it can't be, us. It can't be obesity, because why is obesity destroying us and not destroying the Australians? How, maybe it's because they walk upside down on the other side of the planet. Uh, it's not smoking, because we're actually doing really, really well on smoking compared to other countries. We've actually seen a big decline in smoking. It's not violence. We are more violent than other countries, but we were in 1976 too. So if this is a problem, it actually, violence rates in the US have been dropping recently over time, since about the mid-1990s. So we ought to be seeing improvements compared to the other countries. It's not traffic accidents. That's another thing we do really badly at. But we were doing pretty badly at it in 1976. And curiously, it's not end of life care. Everybody thinks we spend all this money on people at the end of life. Actually, it turns out other countries spent even more as a share of their GDP, of their healthcare system at the end of life. We are not unusual in our spending at the end of life. So it's none of those obvious things people have spent a lot of time thinking about. Another theory people sometimes put forward is that it's because Americans use so much healthcare. That turns out not to be true, partly because so many people were, at least for a long time, uninsured, and because cost sharing is so high, um, we actually use less consultations per capita than most other countries. You can see. The winner here is Japan. People go to the doctor 12 times a year. I don't know. Um, uh, in Sweden, they hardly go at all. Um, if you look at do hospital visits, we're actually really low. We do almost, we're, we're almost as the lowest in the world in terms of how many times we go to the hospital. And when we go to the hospital, we don't spend very much time there. So it's not because American patients are so demanding and they're ringing the doctor's door every day uh, and trying to get more and more care. That can't be the problem because our utilization rates are not especially high. It's not that we have bad management. It actually turns out there have been these really careful studies now. They're very interesting, trying to bring the world of management and policy together, looking at the quality of hospital management. Now, think about why that matters. A hospital is a really complicated place. You want really smart people working really effectively to manage hospitals. It turns out the best managed hospitals in the world are our hospitals in the United States by these metrics that seem to predict things like heart attack mortality. Better managed hospitals have lower heart attack mortality. For those of you who want to be hospital managers, remember that. So we're number one. England is actually number two. So go Wagner alums, because that's what our, our health policy and management alums often do. They manage hospitals, and they keep those heart attack rates low. Um, so it's not the management. It's the prices. The famous uh, Princeton economist, Uwe Reinhardt, who died last year, said, wrote this famous paper called, It's the Prices Stupid. US healthcare prices are just way higher than in other countries. Uh, almost everything in the US healthcare system is paid a higher price than in these other very rich countries that don't pay higher prices for other things. If any of you traveled to any, other, any of the countries on my slide before, hotel rooms and restaurants are not much more expensive than here in New York City. Things are pretty much the same. But in healthcare, that's not true. We pay much higher prices. For example, here are some different kinds of 
uh, price measures from a, an international comparison. These are measures of hospital cost diagnostic imaging and inpatient pharmaceuticals. And if you look at us compared to the other countries, we are just way, way, way more expensive across the board than anybody else, even than Switzerland. Has anyone here been to Switzerland? Switzerland is super expensive. Um, everything is expensive in Switzerland, but not healthcare compared to the United States. We beat them on that. So it is the prices that are much higher in the US than elsewhere. So that's something people have gradually over time come to recognize. But I want to push that a little further and ask, well, what does that do for us? Why are the prices so high, or how do we think about those high prices? So one explanation is the prices are high because the underlying costs are really high. It just costs so much more to produce healthcare, to produce those services in the US. And one of my colleagues whom I really like, not here at Wagner, at another university that we won't talk about, um, says, you know, the problem is there are so many insurance companies, and everybody wants different documentation, and it's the billing, and all of that stuff. That's what makes us so expensive. Now, wait, the first thing you should say to them is, wait, I saw Sherry's slides. There are other countries there that have lots of insurance companies. Why aren't they so expensive? Right? They have Germany, Switzerland. They have lots of insurance companies, but they don't look like us. What's going on here? Why are we so expensive? So one argument is it's these underlying costs that are driving up the prices. But there's another way of thinking about this. Maybe it's not the underlying costs that drive up the prices, but the high prices that actually drive up the costs. Maybe it's not that costs lead to prices, it's that prices lead to costs. That seems strange. How could that actually work out? Well, let me give you some thoughts. And this is really preliminary. I'll show you a little bit of evidence, but mostly this is pretty preliminary. And I'm trying to persuade people, so we'll see. OK, how could prices, high prices lead to costs? So first of all, imagine that the high prices just come from the sky. We're not going to worry about where they come from for the moment. We could talk about that later. Where could those high prices, what could they lead to? Well, the simple answer that I think people fixate on right away is because the prices are high, people are making a lot of money. The shareholders of healthcare companies, the executives, they're making a lot of money. Actually, if that were true, it would be less of a problem. They'd just be taking the money home, and we'd be sort of done with it. Um, but it actually turns out more, most hospitals are not for profit. Um, it's not obvious that the shareholders of healthcare companies are making a lot of money. Still, that's one possibility. But there are more pernicious or difficult problems. One is, with the high prices, hospitals, physicians, labs, and so on have an incentive to buy things like technology, fancy robots, uh, fancy machines, proton beam things, thingies, whatever they are. Uh, right? That's what they advertise all the time now. Right? Why do they do that? Because they think if we invest our surplus in technology, if we, we buy more of that technology, we get those high prices for it, we can attract high paying private insured patients and make a lot of money for our hospital. So let's build fancy lobbies, fancy everything, so that we bring people into our hospital. Because they pay so much money, it's worth it. Second. Maybe what it does is it bids up the prices of the top doctor. Have you ever heard anyone say, I went to the best doctor to get my whatever done? Right? First of all, no one has a clue who the best doctor is, just, just saying. But on top of that, if people believe there is a best doctor, you could imagine hospitals vying to attract those doctors, again, to try and bring in those high-paying private patients. A third possibility is you actually hire more staff of different sorts, for example, one hospital that I will not name has concierges who walk you from the admissions office to your x-ray. Why do they do that? Any idea? Well, one, one reason might be because they want you to feel warm and welcome. But the other idea is because they want that x-ray machine to be working all the time. And they don't want you to dawdle on your way over there. So they send somebody with you to make sure you don't get lost because they don't want to reduce throughput. So you add a lot of non-professional staff to keep the throughput going on your expensive capital. And the final possibility is um, you actually buy more administrators. Why would you buy more administrators? Well, here's why. Imagine that an administrator costs $40,000 a year. OK. And imagine that there are two kinds of patients. There are sick patients, and there are very sick patients. And whether a patient is sick or very sick, they get different amounts of payments. They get twice as much for the very sick patient as for the sick patient. $500 for the sick, $1,000 for the very sick. And imagine that the insurance company is going to pay you for the very sick patient, depending on whether the per person is coded as very sick. Okay, So you're the doctor of the hospital. You mark down what kind of patient it is. 
if, they, if the, you mark down that they're very sick, you get twice as much money than if you mark down that they're sick. Now, you have to justify that. You have to provide some evidence for why you think they're very sick. If you need to, if, you're, if you're, some patient is on the margin, are they sick? Are they very sick? It's going to take a lot of work by the administrator to persuade the insurance company to give you the higher pay payment. Do you see that? Right? So what, well, how many patients does it take? If you only get $500 difference in a low-cost system between the sick and the very sick, that administrator has to code 80 patients up to pay for her salary. Do you all see that? But if I pay twice as much money for everything, that administrator only has to code 40 patients to pay for their salary. So the more um, money, the higher the prices are, the more incentive there is to actually invest in administrators to be able to milk the system for as much as it's worth. OK. So, uh, so what do we know? It turns out, um, with a couple of Wagner master students, we did some work looking at, actually, where does the money in the healthcare system go? And it turns out that the share of the money that goes to profit hasn't moved in about the last 20 years. It's a larger amount of money because the system is bigger, but the share that has gone to profits hasn't moved in 20 years. It actually shrank a little bit in the late 1990s because of the Balanced Budget Act, but you don't need to go there. A big chunk of the money buys new technology and other equipment and stuff for offices and hospitals. That amount of spending, inflation adjusted, increased more than doubled over the period that we're looking at between 1997 and 2012. So over a 15-year period, the amount of money inflation adjusted, the doctors and hospitals spent on technology and equipment uh, more than doubled. The second big piece is compensation. So payments to employees, that went up almost double over that same period. How did it go up? Well, it turns out it went up in the form of higher salaries for doctors and nurses not higher salaries for anyone else, not higher salaries for administrators. That kind of makes sense. If you're a janitor, the wage of janitors is the same in hospitals as it is in office buildings. But if you're a doctor, you can only work in a hospital. You get work. A hospital is a place that hires doctors, not janitor. Not, no one else does. You, you know what I'm saying. OK? They're specialized labor. They're, in this, they're only in this world. Their wages have gone up a lot. Other people's wages haven't gone up so much. So one piece of this is more compensation for highly skilled employees in the healthcare sector. And the second piece of it is more employment of healthcare practitioners, other health support occupations, those people who keep the throughput in the hospital or the doctor's office moving quickly. So quite consistent with what we thought. And that isn't happening elsewhere. So this is the share of the economy that's employed in the healthcare sector. And I don't have as long of a uh, time series here. The, the, world, the OECD just began collecting the data in 2000. But you can see that, again, we've really moved away from the pack over just this 14-year period in terms of the share of all workers in the United States who are employed in the healthcare sector. It's much higher now here than in other places. So what do we know? Um, there is some evidence that high prices actually generate high costs, not the other way around. And there's actually evidence for it on a more micro basis that we could talk about after. It happens through investment and purchase decisions. It happens through payment decisions. It happens through hiring decisions. That's actually a really hard problem to solve. When you have the high prices and it generates high costs, then things that you might do to just reduce cost, they're not necessarily going to bring the prices down. So it's a much harder problem to solve. But all of you are going to solve it. Thank you.